It's spooky time! I had never really planned on making a video of this nature on this channel for a couple of reasons. One being that I am a magnet to the spirit world. I can talk more about that in a different video. But I've had plenty of people who were non-believers before tell me that they were really skeptical about the existence of things like ghosts and anything supernatural until they spent time around me and that, quote, strange things happen around me. The other reason I didn't really plan on making this kind of video is because it's nothing that new. I mean, a lot of people on YouTube share their ghost stories with the world, but I thought maybe it would be a fun idea to go ahead and do it anyway, strictly because something happened very recently. I'm not talking about that recent occurrence in this video, though. I have so many experiences that I'm going to make a series of videos going in as best a chronological order as I possibly can and put them under the ghost discussions playlist. So we're going to begin where it makes the most sense, which is the first ghost encounter I had that I can actually remember right now. This happened when I was six years old. We had recently moved from an old historical house to a house that was built somewhere in the 70s, so it wasn't terribly old. And as I mentioned, I was six years old. My sisters were five, and I think the other one was one. Like, she doesn't even remember the house we were in before that because she was literally a baby. And my parents hadn't gotten the furniture over yet, but they wanted us to start getting used to the new house because it was like... 45 minutes to an hour away from where we used to live. It would have been really stressful for tiny minds and tiny bodies to keep going back and forth, back and forth. So instead, if I remember correctly, they had the three of us staying there with mom and my dad after work would just bring whatever furniture he could over and that was that. So we get to the bedroom that became my bedroom and the way that house is set up, it's set up like a trailer. It's not a trailer, but it's set up like one. You go through the front door and you just go woof, straight back. You can see almost the entire house. So you have the front entrance and the laundry room off of that. And then you go through the kitchen and the dining room. And when you go to the right, that's where the kids section of the house was. On the far right was the playroom at the time. And then there was a little bedroom and then my bedroom and because we were all tiny bodies and we needed the playroom as a playroom the idea my parents had was to have one of us in the tiny bedroom and two of us share my bedroom and I was fine with that because to a little tiny person that bedroom was huge even though it was only like the size of this room <laughs> And we were getting ready to spend our first night there and we were all excited. And my mother took my baby sister someplace else, obviously, because she didn't want anything to happen to her. And my younger sister, who's the middle child, and I were staying in my bedroom in sleeping bags. There was no furniture at all in the room. There were two empty closets against the wall and then we were against the other wall. There's just the one window in that bedroom that was behind us at the time and there was no reflective surfaces there was cigarette stained wallpaper all over the room and a gray carpet and the walls of the closet were matte white with absolutely nothing in them at all my dad actually built all the shelving that's in it currently so bare room we're getting ready to go to sleep and it's, it can't be that late at night yet because I was really young at the time and my mother was still awake in the living room watching television. That's probably the only piece of furniture that was in there besides a couch. And I started apparently making noise and sounding like I was talking to someone and my mother was going to come back to scold me and say, hey, stop keeping your sister awake. 
I, you need to go to sleep. You're a little person. So she comes into the doorway and she's like, hey, you need to stop talking to your sister. It's time for her to go to sleep. And I was like, I'm not talking to my sister. And I pointed over at my little sister and she was sound asleep. And my mom's like, well, who were you talking to then? Like I heard talking in here. And I was like, the guy that's sitting in my closet. And she was like, okay then. And she looked like she was about to brush it off as a child's imagination, but then she started asking me questions. What do you mean the guy sitting in the closet? And I showed her, I was like, he's sitting just like this and he's sitting right in the closet and he's looking at me and he has a black hat and he has a basic shape of a face. Like I could never make out the exact details of his facial features, but he did have a face and he was wearing a suit and I told her all that and the thing that I think made her immediately kind of brush it off as a child's imagination is the fact that it didn't scare me because a little person if they encounter a ghost and it's a scary dangerous presence they're gonna be screaming and carrying on for their mama to get them out of the room and stuff and I was totally fine I was just like no he's really nice this is cool so she was like, whatever, imaginary friend, that's fine. Fast forward a little bit, apparently I saw this guy in my bedroom just about every single night and sometimes during the day, a few times at around lunchtime, she'd be like, you know, go put your toy away in your room and come back out for lunch. And as I was going back through the hallway to get back to the dining room, in broad daylight, I'd be like, he just went past me and he touched my arm. So it wasn't just a night that I saw this guy. I saw him at all times of the day. Sometimes I'd see him walking out in the garden. Sometimes I would see him in my parents' room, in the family room, in the living room, all over the place. It was like he was following me around. And apparently I started even discussing this guy with people at school. And a few of my teachers called my mother and were like, is everything okay because your kid is carrying on about apparent ghosts that they know an awful lot and she was like yeah don't worry about it my kid just has you know some kind of imaginary friend and they were like oh okay that's fine then and this guy stayed with me for an extremely long time in middle school I started getting depression and by the time I reached high school it was bad enough that I was on a regular suicide watch to the point where I was barely able to attend class. I don't have a lot of fun, silly high school stories because I wasn't there for a lot of it. And what's interesting is this ghost started showing up more and more and more the deeper I got into depression. And there were a couple instances where he manifested more clearly than I had ever seen or heard him in my life. I am going to give a quick trigger warning. In order to tell the story correctly, I have to explain a suicide attempt and I have to explain something really dark and horrible that had happened to me involving non-con. <laughs> so if those things bother you, then just fast forward a little bit in the video and when you see me go like this it means that I'm done talking about those triggering things. So the first time he got really clear was around I think 10th or 11th grade so I'm like in my mid-teens now and I was already massively depressed already on suicide watch going to therapy extremely regularly I think every week or every other week it was really bad. I wasn't even allowed to be on the phone by myself and to make matters even worse around this time I started having repressed memories surface of people I had trusted and I'm not going to go into specifics on who it was or how I knew them just people I trusted who had taken advantage of me who had touched me when I was too young to understand that I should say no I just thought I'd get in trouble if I said anything, just terrible things like that. And it was hard. It was 
really painful. It was scary. I didn't know what to do, but I was like, I have to tell someone. If I keep all of this to myself, it's going to drive me crazy. So after a lot of internal conflict, I spoke to my mother about it and I told her what had happened and who it was and everything and this person at that time although they hadn't really changed much in that regard they were currently either married or in a serious relationship with children and my mother's entire reaction to me telling her the story of what this person had done to me was well it's too late to do anything now they have a family and we don't want to ruin that so don't say anything and that kind of threw me off the deep end i was done by that point i couldn't handle anymore and i just had a total breakdown and i remember i was in my bedroom by myself everyone else had gone off someplace and i was crying pretty hard like that horrible choking sob that's so powerful you can't even breathe and you're coughing so it was like that it was really bad and I was just saying, I really need to know someone's there. I'm just having a really hard time right now. I don't want to be alone. I actually felt this spirit that had been with me since age six wrap his arms around me. Like it actually felt like a living human being was holding me from around the back and his arms were coming around my front. And as Clearly, as you hear me speaking now, in my ears, not in my head, I heard a man's voice, a very soft man's voice say, it's going to be fine, you're going to get through this. And I felt the embrace for a really long time until I started calming down and that's when he vanished. And I would feel that same embrace every time I had a really hard time. Second instance of that was one of my suicide attempts, one of the ones that was almost successful, I had sliced through my arm really, really deep. It was bleeding for days and days, and I had tried to cover it up with sleeves and everything. And I remember when it happened, I wasn't completely conscious. I was basically an autopilot. I wasn't thinking, I'm done. I want to die. I wasn't thinking any thoughts remotely like that. I wasn't thinking at all. It was like I was hypnotized. I just wandered into the bathroom, broke a chunk of mirror off, and did the thing. And that was it. And I, once I actually started feeling the pain in my arm, it was like I woke back up. And that's when I started panicking. I was like, what happened? I'm bleeding everywhere. I'm scared. I don't want to die. What's going on? And I ran into my bedroom. I wrapped it all up and I was just freaking out because I was feeling really, really weak from the blood loss and I felt a lot of pain and I didn't want to go to sleep because I kept saying, I don't want to die. I don't know what to do. I don't want to die. I don't want to get in trouble. And again, the same voice, it's going to be fine. You're going to be all right and the feeling of someone embracing me. He did that just about every time something terrible like this happened to me. All right, no more triggering stuff for now. <laughs> this guy, for a while, I thought that he was attached to the house that my parents live in because most of what would happen happened there. For a long time, my mother and I had a very strained relationship and a lot of it was because she didn't seem to understand how severe mental illness worked. She thought because her depression was just her feeling sad, clothes in the drapes, and then wanting help, that's how all depression was. And mine was nothing like that. Mine was a lot more severe and dangerous. And it caused a lot of problems. She would do stuff like empty my entire room so there was nothing but a bed and say I could get my stuff back when I stopped behaving like this and stuff. It was hard for a while. Every time my mother would do something that I found particularly cruel at the time that would make me feel a lot worse that day about myself, something weird would happen. My mother's got actual like paranoia and OCD when it comes to placement of objects and one of those objects is her keys. 
her keys never leave the key rack unless she's actually using them. She has never lost a key in her life. They're either in her hand or they're on the key rack and that's it. And every time she did something I found cruel that really upset me, her keys would disappear only when she needed them. She'd be like, okay, I'm going off to get groceries or something. Where are my keys? What's going on? What'd you do with my keys? Freaking out going all the way through the house. I'd start looking in her purse. I'd look in the bathroom, anywhere that I thought she potentially could have left them. And when she'd be like, well, I can't go shopping now because my keys are missing and she'd get really angry and slumped down on the couch. I'd look over at the key rack and the keys would be back where they're supposed to be. She and I would be the only ones in the house. I would follow her around like a puppy while we were searching. At no point were we isolated from each other and the keys would just come back. And it would make her so crazy because she didn't understand how she wouldn't see them and all of a sudden they'd be there right on the front of the rack. As I mentioned before, for a while I thought this ghost was attached to my parents' house, but I determined around my third year of college or university, if you're from the UK, that he was attached to me instead. A couple of things happened when I was in college that proved this to me, one of which I had two classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and they were about three hours apart. So I would have to just do homework in between because only three hours apart is pointless for me to like go home and come back when it takes 45 minutes either way. So I didn't really feel like being around noisy people. I can't concentrate then. I would go down to the music wing and I would sit in the hallway, plug my laptop in and do my homework and no one ever had an issue with it this creepy guy started showing up and he would talk to me and anyone who he perceived as female at the time in the hallway and it was around summer so I was dressed pretty much like this tank top, mesh gloves, and either shorts or leggings depending on how hot it was that day so it wasn't like I was wearing nothing. He would come up to us And he would start going on about how we needed to go outside to his van because he wanted to fuck us. And when we would protest to this, he would get pretty angry, as you can imagine. That's how people like that are. He would insist that we were advertising and that if we didn't want to be attacked by strangers, we shouldn't be dressed the way that we are. And we'd be like, it's hot. We're not going to be wearing a lot. Get over it. And this guy would harass us just about every single day for like a month. We would try to talk to some of the professors around that wing, and they would just basically go, no, 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 that's impolite. And that's all that would happen. At one point, one of the professors actually called the campus police on me because apparently I was the problem in the situation. And I was starting to get to a point where I had gone from being scared of this guy to just being pissed off and done with his crap. And I had a messenger bag and it was sitting next to me and I was getting really angry. And when I get really, really angry, I start feeling a lot of energy around me. And people say they can feel this angry aura around me when I'm really pissed off. And the guy had already seen me that day. I was pretty finished with him. And then this other guy came up to me and I was talking to a rather large spider. It was just a little garden spider. It wasn't gonna hurt anybody. And I was clearly having a conversation with this spider and having a good time. And the guy just looked directly at me and smashed it right in front of me. And by that point, I was just seething. I was like, I am done. I fucking hate people. I'm not having it anymore. And right when I was at the peak of my anger, I saw my ghost stay next to me and my shoulder bag just flew and tripped the guy. And the guy turned around and looked over at me and was just like, what the hell just happened? Because he'd been kind of watching me the whole time and saw that I had not thrown the bag. That was the first time I realized my ghost was attached to me and not the house. The second time, around the end of my college career, I decided to visit my best friend who lives in England, and I was there for a couple of months. 
And one of the days I was there, it was one of those best friend all nighter thing where you're laying in bed together, but you don't sleep. You just talk the whole night and we're just laughing and having a great time. And she was like, do you see anything in the room? And I was like the guy wearing a black suit that's over in the corner. And she was like, yes. And I'm like, that's my ghost. And she was like, what's he doing in my house? (laughs) Which was kind of funny, but he didn't do anything bad. And then the same thing happened when she came and stayed at my parents' house with me for a couple of months too. She was just laying in bed and she was like, is your friend on the corner of the ceiling over there? And I was like, yeah, the, like, bellowing, wisping black smoke stuff. And she was like, yeah, can you tell him to stop? Because he's really freaking me out. And I was like, hey, knock it off. The way you look right now is freaking her out. And he, like, immediately came down and disappeared. So that's my first ghost story. That's the first ghost I had ever encountered that I can remember anyway. And my experiences with him afterwards... (laughs) And I will have more ghost stories. He is by far not the only experience that I've encountered in my lifetime. I've had many. So if you like this kind of thing, keep an eye on my ghost discussions playlist. That's where I'm going to place these videos. And let me know any of your crazy ghost stories in the comments. And as always, do something that makes you happy today, no matter what anyone else thinks about it. And I'll see all of you very, very soon.